Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Uh, chapter 19 of 1 Samuel, interesting chapter. Two personalities jump off the page at us. One of them is David. The other one is King Saul. And uh, the different perspectives. If you look at that text, you can draw different uh, lessons from that text depending on perspective, who you're really uh, looking at and seeking to draw instruction from. Perspective is an interesting thing. For example, uh, imagine the end of a football game. There's just time for one more play, maybe two seconds on the clock. And they need to score a touchdown to win the game. And if the defense can stop them, then they win the game. So they come out in, uh, in formation. The quarterback gets the ball, throws to the corner of the end zone. The receiver catches the ball, appears to bobble it. And the referee signals whatever you want your team to have. If you're on the defense, you're thinking, there's no way he caught that ball. If you're on the offense, if your team is the offense, you're thinking that was a touchdown. And even with instant replay or review, sometimes they don't get it right, even though they got all the cameras. They don't, instead of saying this, the call is confirmed or the call is reversed, there's this sloppy thing in the middle where they say the call stands because there wasn't enough detail in the instant replay to determine the proper call. There's a fire truck going by. Can we pray for that real quick? Let's pray together. Father, we do pray for whatever's going on in our community with that fire truck. We ask, oh Lord, you protect the first responders, and Lord, that you would um, uh, protect those who are, who are in the situation that need the firemen. Bless that situation, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. <clears throat> Pardon me. Perspective is important. I came across an interesting story. It's a story of uh, two individuals, a couple, husband and wife, and uh, their entries in their journal based on what was happening that day. The wife's journal had eight entries. The husband's journal only had one entry. The wife's journal went something like this. Tonight, my husband was acting weird. We had made plans to meet at a nice restaurant for dinner. Conversation wasn't flowing. So I suggested that we go somewhere quiet so we could talk. He agreed, but he didn't say much. I asked him what was wrong. He said nothing. I asked him if it, were, if it was my fault that he was upset. He said he wasn't upset that it had nothing to do with me and not to worry about it. On the way home, this is the entries, right? On the way home, I told him that I loved him. He smiled slightly and kept driving. When we got home, he just sat there quietly and watched TV. He continued to seem distant and absent. Finally, with silence all around us, I decided to go to bed. About 15 minutes later, he came to bed but I still felt that he was distracted and his thoughts were somewhere else. He fell asleep. I don't know what to do. That's the wife's entries into her journal. Now let's, let's look, listen to what the husband wrote. Let's see what he wrote. One entry. Rough day. Boat won't start. I don't know why. That was it. <laughs> rough day boat won't start I don't know why perspectives right now she thinks it's all about their relationship maybe a, a, a class on communication would help this couple she thinks it's all about their relationship he can't stop thinking about his boat my boat won't start rough day don't know what to do you know as we look at our text today we see two personalities, and the consequence of these two people either following God's will or disobeying God's will. Obeying God's will or disobeying God's will. God's protection is there for us. We're going to see this in the life of King David. And frustration is all that's available if we choose to disobey, go contrary to God's will and word. 
Let's turn in our Bibles to 1 Samuel chapter 19. <clears throat> and I want to look at David from David's perspective. He's protected by Jonathan. He's going to be protected by his wife, Michael, or Michelle, however he wants to pronounce it. And he will be protected by Samuel and God's Holy Spirit. David experiences because he's willing to look at God's word and obey it. He has a different perspective than King Saul. God is going to protect him and bless him. In 1 Samuel chapter 19, beginning at verse 1, reading from the English Standard Version, it says this, And Saul spoke to Jonathan his son and to all his servants that they should kill David. But Jonathan, Saul's son, delighted much in David. Remember, they were very close friends. They loved each other as brothers and fellow soldiers, brothers in arms, as, as it were. He delighted much in David, and Jonathan told David, Saul, my father, seeks to kill you. Therefore, be on your guard in the morning. Stay in a secret place and hide yourself. Jonathan has a plan. He wants to have David hiding, and then he can actually question the king about David and actually plead for him and represent him. He says, I will go and go out and stand beside my father in the field where you are, and I will speak to my father about you. And if I learn anything, I will tell you. And Jonathan spoke well of David to Saul, his father, and said to him, now notice, Jonathan represents David as vigorously as David would represent himself to the king. That's love. He's representing David as David would represent himself. Let not the king sin against his servant David because he has not sinned against you. And because his deeds have brought good to you. He's been good to you, dad. He's represented you. He's fought for the kingdom. He's one of your, he's, if not the best, one of the best soldiers and leaders. For he took his life in his hand and struck down the Philistine, Goliath, as you recall. And the Lord worked a great salvation for all Israel. You saw it and you rejoiced. Why then do you sin against innocent blood by killing David without cause? So, you know, things take a turn. Saul doesn't want to kill David anymore. He welcomes him back into the fold, so to speak. Picking up in uh, verse 8, there was war again. And David went out and fought with the Philistines and struck them with a great blow so that they fled before him. That's, isn't that the crux of the problem? David's success Makes Saul jealous, King Saul. King Saul didn't like David having all this success. Matter of fact, he wanted the Philistines to kill him in battle so he would put him in the heat of the battle, hoping that the Philistines would kill him so he didn't have to. But David experienced success, and that bothers him. Then a harmful spirit from the Lord came upon Saul, King Saul, as he sat in his house, Alan read this text for us this morning. He took, takes a spear and he wants to kill him. This evil spirit, now we've talked about this, and it seems kind of counterintuitive that God would allow an evil spirit to come on King Saul. But know this, beloved, if you don't want God's Holy Spirit, he'll give you what you want. It tells us in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, because they receive not the love of the truth, because they don't have this love for what's true, God will send them strong delusion. If you don't want the truth, God will give you something you can believe. But the truth is out there. What was the, what was the name of that show with Sully? and <laughs> X-Files, thank you very much. The truth is out there. If you want the truth, it's available. But our culture today doesn't want the truth. It's evident, is it not? And what's happening around us, where our leaders can't even define what a woman is, they think, Men can get pregnant, and we've lost, we lost reality. Truth, by the way, beloved, is a propositional statement that conforms to reality. Something is true when it, you know it's real, not some made-up statement about what they want to be true. So a guy allows a harmful spirit to trouble Saul, 
And David was playing the lyre, the guitar, if you will, the harp. And Saul sought to pin David to the wall because he was jealous. He wasn't obeying God's will. He wasn't obeying God's word. He didn't care what God had to say. So he wanted to eliminate the competition. Sought to pin David to the wall with a spear, but he eluded Saul. So he struck the spear into the wall, and David fled and escaped that night, never to be back in the, in the king's court again. So God was using Jonathan to protect David, but when the, the crux of the issue, the jealousy of King Saul percolated to the service, surface, he couldn't help himself. He tried to eliminate the competition. And he's going to continue to try to eliminate the competition. Notice what happens in the next section. Michael, David's wife, protects him. David is being protected by ultimately by God. But God's using human agents for his will. Notice what it says in verse 11. Saul sent messengers to David's house to watch him. You know, he had 24-hour surveillance. Excuse me. That he might kill him in the morning. But Michael, David's wife, remember Michael is King Saul's daughter. It's a family thing going on here too. <clears throat> Michael, David's wife, told him, if you do not escape with your life tonight, tomorrow you will be killed. Maybe her brother Jonathan told her what was going on. Maybe she could hear, she had had conversation with King Saul and knew what was going on. But she knew his, her husband's life was in peril. And she loved him. If you do not escape with your, with your life tonight, tomorrow you will be killed. So Michael let David down through the window and he fled away and escaped. Michael took an image, some translations say a god. I, don't, I can't imagine David having a false god, some kind of image in his house. And uh, put it in the bed with some hair, uh, goat's hair. Laid it on the pit bed and put a pillow of goat's hair at the head and covered it with clothes. So it looked like his, he was sleeping. Jonathan tried to protect David first. Now his wife does. And actually, you know, all he's, she, she, she puts together a ruse to help him escape. Picking up in verse 19, or 14, excuse me. Saul sent messengers to David. She said, he is sick. Then Saul sent the messengers to see David saying, bring him up to me in the bed. If that's, if, if that's what we need to do, bring him up to me in the bed that I may kill him. Quite a different spirit than what happened with the four guys that brought the, the man that was paralyzed on his bed to Jesus. Jesus healed the man and forgave the man. Quite a contrast between Jesus and King Saul. Bring him on the bed that I may kill him. And when the messengers came in, behold, the image was in the bed with a pillow of goat's hair on its head. Saul said to Michael, why have you deceived me thus and let my enemy go? What a perspective to have of David. What did, what did Jonathan say of David? He's done nothing but good to you. He brought great victory to our nation. He defeated the Philistine. But, but King Saul sees him only as an enemy because he's jealous of him, which we'll talk about here in a, in a few minutes, what was percolating to the surface in his life so that he has escaped. You let my enemy go so that he has escaped. And Michael answered Saul, he said to me, let me go. Why should I kill you? So it's not my fault. He wanted to kill me, <laughs> you know. She's just uh, throwing, again, throwing the ruse out there. I'm not responsible for what happened. But truly, she loved her husband, wanted to protect him. So Jonathan protected him. Michael, or his wife, protected him. And Samuel's going to protect him. Verse 18. Now David fled and escaped, and he came to Samuel at Ramah and told him all that Saul had done to him. Remember, Samuel anointed Saul to be king over the nation. But because Saul failed, he anointed David to be king. Now Jonathan could see that David was going to be king. Jonathan could see that. And he knew that it was for jealousy that his father, King Saul, wanted to eliminate the competition. So David goes to Samuel, somebody King Saul respects, and says, told him all that was happening. King Saul's trying to kill me. He's tried to kill me at least three times, throwing spears at me. And 
And he went to Samuel and lived at Naoth. And it was told Saul, behold, David is at Naoth in Ramah. Then Saul sent messengers to David when he saw the company of the prophets prophesying. And Samuel, standing his head over them, the Spirit of, the, of, of God came upon the messengers of Saul. They also prophesied. Now, notice, he's with Samuel. He's at Ramah and Naoth, and he's there with the prophets. And as these messengers approach to capture David or kill him, the Spirit of God comes upon them, and they're changed. And they begin to prophesy, and beloved, Prophecy, we tend to think of it as foretelling the future. We kind of think of it almost uh, in a, a sense of, uh, you know, forecasting the future. But prophecy is nothing more than speaking forth God's word. Now, the Old Testament prophets and the New Testament prophets, they, they would prophesy, they would speak God's word to God's people, and at times they would, in their messages, talk about what was going to happen in the future. Isaiah 53 is a perfect example about the suffering servant of, of, of the Messiah. Psalm 22 is another example. Psalm 22 starts this way. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Does that sound familiar from the New Testament? But it's merely, when you go through most of the prophets, it's not so much the foretelling of the future, speaking forth the word of God for the future. It's speaking forth the word of God to the people of the day and their disobedience to God's word. And so these messengers of death are actually beginning to speak forth, the word, speak forth the word of life. And so, what a surprise. God protects David with Samuel, but also through the Spirit of God coming upon the messengers. They begin to speak forth God's word. Okay, let's pick up, um, let's see. In verse 21, when it was told Saul, he sent other messengers, and they also prophesied. And Saul sent messengers again the third time, and they also prophesied. Three strikes, you're out. Then he himself went to Ramah and came to, to the great well that is in Seku, and he asked, where are Samuel and David? And one said, behold, they are in Naoth in Ramah. And he went there to Naoth, and in Ramah, and the Spirit of God came upon him also. Now, remember, the Spirit of God left him, and he had an evil spirit from God, but now the Spirit of God comes upon him again. And by the way, just to give you a, kind of a quick heads up, I believe, I think, I think we will see King Saul in heaven. When we get to the end of this book, you'll see why I think that. I think he, he's, just, he's a tormented believer. He's struggling. Now, some people disagree with that. It's fine. We'll find out when we get there, right? One thing I know is I'm going to be there, and I hope you're going to be there too. Amen? Amen. I want us to be there not just here on Sunday mornings. I want us to be in heaven forever. <clears throat> By the way, it's a, it's a wonderful place, much better than Hawaii, right? <laughs> Hawaii is a nice place, but it, it doesn't even hold a candle to, to heaven. <clears throat> anyway, the Spirit, of, the Spirit of God came on him also. And as he went, he prophesied <clears throat> until he came to Naoth and Ramah. And he too stripped off his clothes. I'm not sure why that was happening. And he too prophesied before. Isn't the Bible interesting? <laughs> kind of, what's going on here? Right? And he too prophesied before Samuel lay naked all that day and all that night. Thus it is said, is Saul also among the prophets? God was protecting David through human agency, through Jonathan and through Michael and Samuel, but also through supernatural agency with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit came upon King Saul, so he no longer desired to eliminate his competition. Will God protect us like he protected King David? <clears throat> the answer, beloved, is yes. God will protect us. We need to remember, beloved, that God is all-knowing and not surprised by anything. All that was happening with David, with, with King Saul, with Jonathan and Michael and then Samuel and all the Spirit of God coming upon, that did not take him by surprise. He didn't go, oh my gosh, I didn't see that coming. He was 
not taken by surprise. Listen to what Psalm 31:15 says. My times are in your hand. Beloved, your times are in God's hands. All that has, transpires in your life, the ups and the downs, the frustrations, the blessings, the, the difficulties, all those come from his hand. My times are in your hand, David says. Rescue me from the hand of, of my enemies and from my persecutors. What a prayer. We could pray that prayer today. Rescue us, O oh Lord, from our, from our enemies. Now, we're called not to have enemies, but sometimes we can be the enemy of, of people for, for no apparent reason or for a, a, a reason that doesn't even make sense. I've had people look at me and say, you know, Pastor, I don't like you. I don't ever want to be around you. I don't like you. I said, well, <laughs> it's a deli counter. Take a number. The line's pretty long. <laughs> right? We all have people for no apparent reason they dislike us, and that's okay. As long as we're following, you know, David didn't want King Saul to be against him. King Saul was jealous and angry and insecure. And all those things percolated because he knew David was his replacement. And he didn't like it. My times are in your hands. Hebrews chapter 4, 13 says this. After that one verse in verse 12, 4, 12, where it says the word of God is alive and powerful, sharp, sharper than any two-edged sword. He goes on to say in verse 13, no creature, no person is hidden from his sight. But we are all naked and exposed. Maybe that's what was going on with King Saul in, in 1 Samuel 19. All things are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. God sees it all. You know, people can put up a front. They can, they can, you know, throw out some subterfuge. They can lie and deceive, manipulate. But God sees it all. And we can draw tremendous comfort that, beloved, hear me, he's going to make the books right. I draw tremendous comfort that God's going to make it right. It's hard to wait, is it not? It's hard to wait, but I know this. Judgment's coming. I, I, I've told you this. Forgive me for being repetitive. I like to watch crime TV, and sometimes individuals who have done despicable, horrible acts will take their own life. And it's interesting to me to hear sometimes the family members saying they took the easy road. They got, they got away with it. They weren't going to face justice. That is true. They are not going to face human justice. But God's justice is so much sweeter, so much more can I say more perfect? <laughs> Thank you, Chris. <laughs> it's perfect. You don't get away with anything. Nobody gets away with anything. And so uh, it's all, we all have to give it up. It's all, open. so, you know, we can trust it. No matter what's happening in our lives, God knows and he has a reason and a purpose for it happening. God will defend us and get us through whatever difficulty or harassment we might face. Listen to Psalm 121, verses 1 and 2. I lift up my eyes to the hills from whence comes my help. My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. Psalm 121, 1 and 2 is a wonderful promise to us. I look for help. He's my protector. He's going to see me through. He's going to help me. Psalm 18, 2 says this, The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. God will be there for me. Romans 8, 31, you know this. What shall we say then to these things? If God be for us, help me. You guys know it. <laughs> you guys been looking at my notes? <laughs> you know the word. If God is for us, who can be against us? If God is for us. We are more than conquerors. Paul goes on in that section to say, we are more, we're not just conquerors, we're more than conquerors. Be it a physical enemy, be it a medical enemy, be it a relational enemy, whatever it might be, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Maybe you're here this morning thinking, Pastor, if that's true, why are Christians dying and our lives have so many difficulties? Why, do, why are Christians being persecuted? If that's true, if, if God is for us, why? That's a great question. That percolates to the surface many times when we're going through hardships and difficulties. I thought, you know, something happens to me, and I've had these conversations with God. Lord, I'm on your team. I'm part of your family. What's happening? I don't get it. 
it, it, it shocks you, especially when it confronts you and you say, Lord, please help me here because this doesn't seem fair. This doesn't seem right. The question percolates right to the surface. Listen to what Hebrews 11 says. Some were tortured. It goes through the hall of faith, you know, goes down through uh, Abel, Enoch, Abraham, Jacob, Isaac, Sarah, Moses. It goes down through the hall of faith, right? It talks about their exploits. And then there's some within the hall of faith. He goes, you know, time, he says, time would escape us. We could talk about Gideon and Jephthah and the others. And he said, but then he talks about the ones who had victory in a different way. Instead of walking through the Red Sea on dry ground, instead of Abraham having a son in his old age, instead of you know, uh, Gideon being victorious over the Midianites, some were tortured, refusing to accept release, so that, might, so that they might rise again to a better life. Others suffered mocking and flogging and even chains and imprisonment. There's Christians, beloved, in our day that are experiencing Hebrews 11. This part of Hebrews 11. <clears throat> they're in prison. They're tortured. They were stoned. They were sawn in two. Uh, tradition has it that Isaiah was put into a log and they sawed him in half with a two-man saw. Can you imagine being in that log? And you hear the... And you know the blade's coming for you. <clears throat> they were killed with sword. They were about in skins of sheep and goats, destitute, afflicted, mistreated, listen, of whom the world was not worthy. It seems like a contradiction. The text tells us, listen, they were all commended for their faith. Those who had victories in this life and those who had victories in facing death. God was there with them, both. Some were delivered through difficulties, or from difficulties. Others were delivered through death. But all, listen, all were victorious. Think of the martyrs. Think of uh, Latimer and Ridley who were burned at the stake by Bloody Mary in England. Lord, open the, king of, uh, open the king's eyes, Tyndall said, as he was burning at the stake. Open the king of England's eyes. Remember Jim Elliot's? You know the story of Jim Elliot, murdered by the Indians down, the, the indigenous people down in South America? He said this. People thought he was foolish to go on a mission trip, to go live among the natives in... in uh, in uh, the jungles of South America. He said, he is no fool. He is no fool who gives up what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. Our world, we, we look at it in a, in a balance sheet and we go, that's foolish to give up all the stuff that you have in your life. He said, he is no fool who gives up what he cannot keep. And by the way, beloved, I don't care what you own in your life, what you have in your, in your uh, portfolio, someday someone else is going to own it. It's only temporary. And that's why he could say, he is no fool who gives up what he cannot keep. I've never seen a U-Haul being pulled by a hearse, right? Hearses don't pull U-Hauls. They have one occupant. Well, they have the driver too. <laughs> but they, they have an occupant who's not there anymore. Just his remains. Just her remains. He is no fool who gives up what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. Remember what Jesus said? Store for yourself treasures in heaven where moth and rust cannot corrupt, where thieves cannot break, up and, break in and steal. You know, every night, Lucy will say to me, are you going to patrol? I said, yeah, I'll patrol. So I go, I make sure the cars are locked. I check all the doors, make sure all the windows are locked. And I said, we're good. Got my rifle. I'm there by the door. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> it's because we live in a broken world, right? We lock our doors. We lock our cars. 
My neighbor across the street said to me, hey, about 3.30 in the morning, because he, he, he works night shift. He, get, he, gets home around, uh, he gets home around like 7 in the morning. One night he had off, he looked out his front door, he could see my, my floodlight turned on. There was, a, there was a kid on a bicycle checking doors in our neighborhood. See if someone left something open, maybe he left some money in the car, get, you know, get some change. We live in a broken world. That's why we lock things. You can't keep it. Store, store it where it's protected in heaven. Let's shift gears here a little bit. We're talking about David's, David's, he saw God's word. His perspective was, I'm going to obey God's word, and God protected him. King Saul had a different perspective. He knew God's word, but he was willing to disobey God's word and God's will. And there was consequences. King Saul's perspective. He was king. He was the anointed one. Yet David was getting all the attention. We see his insecurity and his fear that overwhelmed him. That insecurity, that fear that overwhelmed him turned to jealousy and anger and murder. Because he was not willing to put into practice God's word or accept God's decisions. King Saul had God's will revealed to him. Listen to what it says in the text. We've read this in 1 Samuel chapter 13, verse 14. Samuel says to King Saul, but now your kingdom shall not continue. The Lord has sought out, sought out a man after his own heart. And the Lord has commanded him to be prince over his people because you have not kept what the Lord commanded you. That, remember, that was when he was offering the offerings because he was waiting for, for Samuel. Samuel was delayed. He didn't arrive at the right time. So King Saul said, I forced myself. I made the offering. It wasn't appropriate for him to do it because he was of the tribe of Benjamin. He was not a priest like Samuel. And Samuel told him, God has taken the kingdom from you and given it to someone who has a heart after him. Samuel knows this. I'm assuming King Saul knows this, that God's going to replace him. And then in the matter of the Amalekites, we brought back Agag and the best of the flock. Samuel says in 1 Samuel 15, the Lord has torn the kingdom of Israel from you this day and given it to a neighbor of yours who is better than you. I wonder if those words echoed in his mind, who's better than you. He knew David was the one. Jonathan knew it was. Matter of fact, we're going to read about Jonathan later in this book where he looks at King David and says, I know you're going to be king. Please don't do anything bad to my family. Because in those days, when a new king from a new dynasty came to the throne, they wiped out the, the, all the family of the previous dynasty so there would be no rivals to the throne. That's just what they did. So Jonathan would look at David and say, I know one day you're going to be king. Please, by the covenant that we've made one with another, protect my family. And David will fulfill that covenant with Mephibosheth. We'll read about him. So someone better than you. That must have resonated in, in King Saul's mind. And remember what happened when David would come back from battle, when they would send him out to the Philistines and they, they would come back from battle? Well, remember what they would, the women would sing as they come out with Tamar, the cheerleaders, basically, right? And that day, the cheerleaders would come out with their pom-poms and their tambourines, and they would say, Saul has slain his thousands and David his ten thousands, remember? And so King Saul says, they just said thousands for me and ten thousands for David. This isn't fair. I'm the king. What's left but the kingdom? He knew that David was the man that God picked. I'm not sure how it could have fleshed out. We kind of see it fleshing out in the life of Jonathan. Jonathan said he was, the, he was the heir of the throne. He was the prince. Yet the prince would say to David, I know one day you'll be king. And I'm here to serve you. It must have been uncomfortable for King Saul. It must have been hard to swallow because he was king and was going to be removed. But beloved, in those areas of our life where we realize that God has selected someone else for that or has not given us what we wanted, I'm convinced if we will take what God gives us because it's his will, 
we will be happier. We will be more fulfilled. Yesterday, Pastor Stephen was talking at our uh, men's group, and he was listening to a sermon on Jonah, and he quoted the, the, the pastor, the preacher. It said something to the effect, uh, we get frustrated when God doesn't answer our prayers, right? We want yes. But God's answers sometimes are yes, wait, or no, right? Yes, wait, maybe, or no. And the, the truth of the matter is, beloved, um, God always answers our prayers in what's best for us. Sometimes we don't like that what's best for us kind of thinking. But the, but the preacher said it this way. We would answer our prayers exactly like God does if we knew what God knew. You hear me? We would answer our prayers exactly the way God answers our prayers if we only knew as God knows. King Saul did not like the answer. King Saul did not like what God was revealing and, or, or revealing about his destiny and what was going to happen to his kingdom. So it turned to jealousy. It turned to anger. It turned to insecurity, paranoia, and he tried to eliminate the competition. Somebody that was better than him. That had to echo in his mind. And as, King, as David would come back, Saul has slain his thousands, but David his ten thousands. It must have bothered him tremendously. He resisted God's will. Listen to what Psalm 2 says. Psalm of David says this, Why did the nations rage and the people plot a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed. They want to fight against God. Who benefits if we fight? Do we benefit if we fight against God? Gamaliel actually says it in Acts chapter 5. It is, he's talking to the, the Sanhedrin, to the religious leaders, as they were trying to stop the apostles from speaking forth God's word. And he says, hey, if this, is from God, if this isn't from God, it's going to fail. It's going gonna, it's gonna to stop. And he goes through history about what's, what that's happened in the past. If this isn't from God, it's going gonna, it's gonna to die out. But if it's from God, there's no way you're going to stop it. Unless you think you can fight against God. What wise words to say. What perspective do you have today? Do you want to be obedient to God's word? And sometimes obedience is a challenge because God is asking us to do things we don't want to do. I want to go my own way. I want to have that, whatever that might be. I want to be involved in that situation. Do you have that perspective? I'm willing, like King David, and it led to protection. It led to blessing. It led to leadership or are you going to be like king saul and say you know i know that what this is what god's word says but i'm going to do my own thing here it never hear me when we go against god's word it never turns out right we never get what we think we're going to get we never fulfilled it always disappoints the only thing that brings real fulfillment beloved is jesus and following christ Let's purpose today to follow Christ. And if that means I need to take the lower seat, someone once said to me, after one of our assistant pastors was preached, said to me, Pastor, you better watch your back. I said, hey, he wants the job, he can have it. <laughs> I want God's word to be proclaimed whether I'm the lead pastor or not. And by the way, we have great pastors here. I'm not talking about me. Our assistants are, are amazing. God has blessed our church with great leaders. Hear me. And if it means I take a lower seat, I take a lower seat. I want God to be glorified in our congregation. Truly. Whatever that looks like. But if, if we're willing to embrace what God's spirit is directing, what God's word is speaking, there's nothing but blessing on the horizon if we're willing to choose that perspective. Would you stand with me? Let's close in prayer. <clears throat> Let's pray together. Father, we stand before you this morning. We pray, Lord, that you would be glorified in us, your people. Lord, 
you taught us to pray, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth that is in heaven. And Lord, we ask that in our individual lives and in our church life, Lord, that we as your people, that we as individuals, your will would be done in our lives. That we would glorify your name here on earth, that we would do your will here on earth just as we will one day in heaven. For your kingdom and glory's sake, Lord. Forgive us of our rebellion. Forgive us of our, of our sin as we seek to turn and do our own thing. We ask, O oh Lord, that you would be glorified in us and through us. For your kingdom and glory's sake, we pray. Amen.